We all know how intimidating it is to start a new software, but fear not, I'm going to reveal some aspects of Procreate that are really easy to understand but might be a little lesser known, especially if you're a beginner. By the end of this video, hopefully you'll be able to work faster, things will feel a little bit easier. So I'm going to assume that you have kind of a working knowledge of Procreate already, like how to open up a canvas or what a layer is. And if that's you and you're an absolute newbie to Procreate, then I'd love to make a dedicated video just about those basics. For now, my goal is to clue you in on some superfluous features that will hopefully enable you to spend more time making art and less time being frustrated about all of the tools. We're going to divide up all of these tips into just three categories. The first section will be all about organizing your workflow. The second will be what I like to call game changers. The last category will be all about fun extra tips that aren't necessary to creating amazing artwork but they're super fun to know about. But before I get too carried away, hey, I'm Rachel and I make art videos here on YouTube. In the past, I've really only made art vlogs and time-lapse videos, but I'm trying my hand at more educational content. Consider me that strange, crusty mage sitting in the corner of the tavern offering you completely unsolicited art advice on your quest for better art skills. First off, let's explore how canvas stacks work. Think of it as a virtual folder that contains multiple canvases. It allows you to group related artworks together, making it easier to manage and navigate through your projects. To create a canvas stack, simply tap on the select option in the top right corner, and then tap on the artworks you'd like to put in your stack. Once you have a canvas stack, you can add additional canvases to it. To do that, tap and hold on a canvas until it lifts off the screen, then drag it into the desired folder. You can add as many canvases as you like and even reorder them within the stack by simply dragging and dropping. I love using canvas stacks to organize my work and you can see here I even have an archive folder that's just full of old artwork that I don't want to delete but I definitely don't want it crowding up my workspace. Sometimes when we're in the midst of a project it can be so disruptive to go searching through the huge brush library for the perfect brush. So my next tip is all about how to create a favorites folder for your go-to brushes. You can access the brush library by tapping on the brush icon in the top toolbar. You'll have to scroll up a bit and then click on the blue plus icon. Then it'll give you the option to name your folder. We'll call it my faves for this example. Once you've named the folder it's time to add your favorite brushes. Just tap and hold on a brush you want to add to the folder, then drag it over to the folder you'd like to add it to. Repeat this process for each brush you want to include in your folder. This next tip is so insanely simple, but it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure it out, and that's just naming your canvas. There are two simple ways to do this. The first is from the launching page. Simply click on the text and it'll give you the option to type your title. The second way can be found when you're actually inside the document. You just click on the little wrench on the top left and then click on canvas information. Then click on the text at the top and again it'll give you the option to type your new title. Frequently, artists will use references when they're drawing or looking for color and lighting combinations. If you have a reference you'd like to look at while you're drawing, but you don't want to just import the photo into your actual canvas, Procreate actually has a reference tool. Click on the little wrench at the top left of your screen, make sure that the canvas menu is selected, then go down and toggle reference. This will give you three options to reference. The first is just your actual canvas. This is helpful when you zoom in for drawing details, but you still want to see the big picture, literally. The second option is image. Here you can select any photo you have saved to your camera roll. The third option is to reference yourself. At first I thought this was just kind of a mirror option to help you feel like an old master, you know, have a little Rembrandt moment. 
To be honest, I have no idea what this one is used for and it kind of freaks me out. If you know what <laughs> this does and you have a use for it, please let me know in the comments. I would love to know because this is just, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> The next tip is all about the drawing guide. This is especially helpful if you're doing any sort of grid drawing or perspective. First, you guessed it, we're going to click on our BFF, the little wrench at the top. Then we're going to make sure that we're on the canvas menu and you'll find the toggle drawing guide. If we click edit drawing guide, which is just right below that, it'll open up some options for us. We can change the color, size, thickness, and opacity of these drawing guides. The first is just a normal 2D grid and we can also select isometric or perspective. This gives us a vanishing point for one point perspective that we can move around, but we can also add more vanishing points if we need and adjust them. This can be a super helpful tool when you need a little extra help getting your perspective and proportions accurate in your drawing. Speaking of checking proportions, the next tip can be a blessing and a curse. Fair warning, you might become addicted to this one, and that's just flipping the canvas. Oftentimes, artists will use this tip to double check their drawing and reveal any wonky angles or proportions. We do this by going to the top left little wrench, clicking canvas, and then hitting flip horizontal. Sometimes it's hard to tell what's wrong with the drawing when something feels off. When we flip the canvas, we're changing our point of view and flaws can be more apparent, which is actually a good thing because now we know how to fix it and create a better outcome. This next tip is super simple, but totally underrated if you're not using it, and that's just adjusting the opacity of your layers. When you click on a layer, tap on the N and it will bring up layer modes, which we'll talk about next, but at the top, you'll notice a sliding bar that's labeled opacity. This will allow you to make the layer that you've selected more transparent. This is helpful when you're cleaning up your line work and you want to keep your rough sketch underneath, but you don't want to be confused by what lines you've already drawn on the new layer. Since we have the layer menu pulled up, this seems like a good time to talk about blending modes. These modes can add depth, highlights, and unique effects to your artwork. The first one is just the normal default blending mode where colors are applied without any blending or interaction. Multiply is a super popular blending mode and it just darkens the colors of the layer below it. It just multiplies the color values of the current layer with those that are underneath, resulting in just an overall darker appearance. Overlay can be really strong sometimes, but it just increases the contrast and saturation of the underlying layer. Color Dodge is another popular layer mode, especially for anime styles. It has a super bright and intense lighting effect. Soft light adds a subtle glow and just softens the colors of the underlying layer. It behaves similarly to shining a diffused light onto the layer. Color Burn darkens the colors of the underlying layer more intensely than Multiply does, and it creates deep and dramatic shadows. I'll be honest, I don't use all of these blending modes in my paintings, and after a lot of practice and experimentation, I find that if I'm going to use a blending mode, which I don't always, I usually use multiply, overlay, and sometimes a soft or hard light mode. However, I think it's valuable to play around with all of them and see which different effects they have on your artwork. Sometimes when I'm stuck on a painting, I'll play with the blending modes and it'll surprise me by adding an effect I wouldn't have thought of and it truly enhances my art. My best advice is just to experiment with them on your own and you'll discover which ones you like best, how you like to use them, or if you just want to ignore them altogether. I've mentioned before in previous videos that I'm actually a high school art teacher, and I teach a lot of different classes, but one of them is digital art. And if my students could only learn one thing in the class, it would be this. Please use alpha lock and clipping masks. It will make your life so much easier. They have very similar results, but let's talk about the difference. Alpha lock is also known as a transparency lock. It's a feature that allows you to restrict editing to the transparent areas of a layer while preserving the existing opacity. To activate alpha lock, tap on the layer and choose alpha lock. The layer thumbnail will display a checkerboard pattern to indicate that alpha lock is enabled. Once alpha lock is activated, you can freely paint or edit on the layer, but the changes will only affect the opaque areas, preserving the transparency of the layer. Alpha Lock is particularly useful for making color adjustments, adding texture or shading to specific areas, or applying effects without altering the transparent parts of the layer. But let's say we wanted to have a similar effect without completely changing and permanently affecting that layer. Then we might want to use a clipping mask. 
A clipping mask is a feature that allows you to restrict the visibility of a layer based on the content of the layer directly below it. The content of the clipping layer is confined or clipped to the shape of the base layer. In other words, anything you draw will not go outside of that silhouette of the base layer. To create a clipping mask, simply tap on the layer and choose Clipping Mask. Any changes made to the clipping layer will only be visible within the boundaries of the base layer. This allows for precise editing and detailing without affecting the areas outside of the base layer. We can also turn on and off the clipping mask, which is an advantage over Affilock. To sum up, clipping masks control the visibility of a layer based on the content of the layer below it, while Affilock allows you to edit only the opaque areas of a layer, preserving the transparency. Both features offer flexibility and control when working with layers, and they can be used individually or in combination to achieve different effects and different editing workflows. The Liquify tool in Procreate is a powerful feature that allows you to manipulate and distort your artwork after you've already drawn it. It gives you control over its shape and form. Tap on the magic wand on the top left and go all the way down the menu to Liquify. From here, you can make a lot of adjustments and play with different options. I mainly keep the size fairly large and use the push option, but feel free to experiment and find what works for you. I will say that using the Liquify tool to save you from all of your drawing fumbles isn't the best habit to get into, but in a pinch it can really help you make those minor adjustments without having to redraw the entire thing. This tip has to do with making gradients in Procreate. One of the few drawbacks to this software is the lack of a dedicated gradient tool. Instead we have to get a little creative. I like to use the feathered selection tool to help me achieve those different tones in a gradient. I do this by going to the freehand selection tool, then selecting color fill and sliding the feather option to get these soft edges. You can also lay down different tones on a layer and then use the Gaussian blur tool to subtly blend things together. This adds a really professional and dreamy touch to your compositions. Have you ever wanted to make a symmetrical design? All you have to do is go back to the drawing guide and tap Symmetry. This affects the whole layer and you can draw whatever you want on one side and it will automatically mirror it on the other side of the line. If you've played around in Procreate, you've probably noticed the magic wand on the top left corner. It gives you a ton of different options to play around with, but here are some of my favorites. Halftone will add this old-timey texture of little dots to your drawing like an old newspaper print. Glitch will create this fun effect where it glitches out all of your pixels. Chromatic Aberration will distort the colors and create a similar glitch effect, but it's a little bit more subtle. You can select any of these tools and have it affect the entire layer you're on, or you can select pencil and be a little more precise about where you want to add it to your drawing. The final tip I have for you is to take advantage of Procreate's built-in time-lapse. Go to the little wrench and then tap video, and you can select time-lapse replay to see a time-lapse of your drawing. You can even export your time-lapse and save the file so you can post it or share it. And that wraps up our journey through the hidden gems of Procreate. I hope that these not-so-secret secrets will help you feel more confident and that knowing these tips will make drawing and procreate feel easier, faster, and more enjoyable. And now that you're itching to try these iPad tips out, I have another video for you. It's just a little draw with me video and some time-lapse footage of me drawing some Instagram suggestions. So if you'd like some company while you draw, I'll put it on the screen for you. And someday I'll have a better way to end a video, but today is not that day. So 